Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for actually inviting me. Um, I must be the only guy in the room who has a Swiss passport who was born in Spitz, doesn't speak any German. So I apologize profusely. I'm Swiss by birth, but I live in the UK via North America. Um, my name is Richard Morell. I'm the uh, cloud evangelist at Red Hat in North America. Uh, I, I don't work for Red Hat Europe, I work for Red Hat in North America. I work more directly to the office of the CTO. Uh, and I spend my life talking to uh, roomfuls of people around open cloud, around uh, open source and Linux. And for my sins, I've been involved in Linux now for nearly 16 years. I'm one of only two people in Europe who's been paid full time to work on Linux since 1997. Myself and Alan Cox. Uh, I was the first person to deploy a high availability Linux cluster in Europe for tunnel, -tunnel railing. Uh, I've worked in projects across Europe ever since. Uh, I was co-founder of a company called Linux Care in San Francisco that bombed massively. Um, I wrote a thing called SourceForge, which you may have used. I was co-architect on a thing called SourceForge. Um, and I've been involved with Linux security, uh, a project called Smoothball, which had about 30 million users over the last sort of 10, 12 years, another one called IPCOP, and a Swiss security project based on free BSD called Monowall, which some of you may have used. Uh, I worked in industry as well. I was the chief security officer globally for the Virgin Group, and I founded a thing called Zimbra, which was a, an exchange client on Linux to replace uh, mailing platforms that was acquired by Yahoo. But for the last three or four years, I've been working with governments uh, seconded to work with the European Union, with the British government. Uh, I'm an advisor at the White House and the US in our revenue services on cloud security, cyber terrorism, fraud. Um, and I, 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 I specialize in giving advice to governments, which they promptly don't listen to normally. Um, but I give the advice anyway on forensic security, on cyber terrorism. Um, and for the last 18 months, I've been advising one-on-one uh, -on -one with the U.S. Director of Cybersecurity at the, uh, the Office of the Executive Branch of the White House and with the U.S. End of Revenue Service. <coughs> so a lot of my time is spent going out, talking about cloud and trying to dissolve some of the hype around what we assume as technologists is meant by the word cloud, talking about virtualization. And I, I try and ignore for my sins anything that comes out of IDC or Forrester or Gartner when they put a figure on what cloud is worth to us as potential consumers of technology. And I try and work with organizations to help them focus on what they actually want to achieve with the staff that they've got now, the platforms that they've got now to be able to go to cloud in a very easily digestible way. But to get the best out of the people that we have already on our payroll, the guys who've got Python skills, the guys who've got uh, the ability to use Ruby or the XML developers without having to necessarily look to, a, to an outsourced system integrator partner and to try and push and promote a sense of being able to get to cloud at their own pace within the acceptable budgets that they've got without stretching their governance or their risk or, or, or thinking about threat. And a lot of the time I'm talking to government officers around what they would like to do with public, private, hybrid cloud. And the message is deafening in the respect that they don't know. They, they genuinely don't know what they want to do with cloud. And as I work with companies like Amazon, who have a huge amount of Red Hat technology within their stack, it becomes increasingly obvious that across the European Union, you have government offices and you have IT offices within government who are going to, to Amazon with a credit card, whether it's in health, whether it's in finance. They can move a process quicker to Amazon than they can by following internal processes. And sooner or later, someone's going to go to jail. It's as simple as that. It might not happen in a month. It might happen in six months. But it is alarming the extent to which data privacy regulations and ANISA guidelines and European regulations around privacy are just ignored wholesale by the people who wrote them. So we try at Red Hat. Um, and I, I'm not a sales guy, I, I don't work with sales guys, I don't have a sales target. My, my job is essentially to, to go out there and to try and get people to behave themselves and not to, not to commit suicide with cloud, to do it nicely. Um, now, my sales guys don't particularly like that because they have sales targets and they want to sell stuff. Uh, and my job essentially is to get you there in one piece 
while also enabling you to understand what you can't move, what you should be thinking about moving, and potentially the resources and the elastic computing resources outside of your network that you can embrace to get you there faster and quicker, but with the security and the granularity that you need. And to many system integrator partners that we work with globally, and we've been working with for a decade, and who are a value part of our ecosystem, it's just as much educating these guys that they need to stop and think about how they work with their customers. Because if you talk about cloud to your average storage sales guy, he just sees an opportunity to sell more disks. If you talk to a guy at IBM, he sees an opportunity to sell more blade servers. But no one system integrator seems to have the complete picture. Traditionally, if you look at governments in the European Union, there's been a, 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 an erosion of skill sets, where over the years they've built this huge reliance on these system integrator partners who come in and then leave, and they take the skills with them. There's no skills transfer to the existing staff. And we're trying to push and promote a sense where you can try and push these guys who, 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 no matter where they are in your infrastructure, to give them the skill sets that they need to go out there and start thinking about how uh, cloud and virtualization and the whole elastic piece can, can become part and parcel of your growth as you move forward. But also we need to start thinking about year one, year two, year three of cloud, how we audit what we've built. Because when you talk to the major audit companies, these are the guys who traditionally would come into your data center with a copy of NMAP. Now, they're not overly skilled. They would come in, give you a dump, and say, right, vulnerable services, number of ports, et cetera, et cetera. You can't do that and follow the same mentality. So many auditors do not understand how they're going to start auditing cloud and how they're going to work with these customers. So as much as we're helping the government customers, we're trying to help the system integrators, and also to try and help the auditors all play nicely together so that it doesn't end up being one car crash which pulls away from the message and the hype that IDC, Forrester and Gartner would have you believe that cloud is this nice fluffy thing. And the main message is about open cloud, being open. And there are some specific things you need to think about when we talk about open clouds, and that open clouds should be built entirely on open source code, freely available code, whether it's licensed under Mozilla license or GPL, any OSI approved license. But it should have a strong, viable, independent community who are out there pushing and promoting the growth of their libraries, whether it's Puppet, whether it's Boxbinder, whether it's uh, Aeolus Project. There should be an independent community and ecosystem out there to, to support it. And we talk about open standards. And I find it quite terrifying because I go to cloud conferences all over the world. Do you see? Typically, I was at um, World Hosting Day in Rust in Germany last year. It's a great big complex. And you had Intel, RSA, and IBM in one corner, and then three or four other guys in another corner, and none of them talking to each other, all of them having the same conversation and spending the same money, but no one getting into the middle of the room and saying, how do we move this forward? Because there's so much intellectual property at risk, and so much potentially from an a, a, a earnings perspective at risk. And things like freedom of information and freedom to use IP never ever come into it. But we should be thinking about open in the respect that we should be able to deploy whatever we want on an architecture rather than be locked into an Amazon or a Rackspace or a, another third party type cloud. We should be able to be able to do this using our own methodologies and we should be able to do it openly. So the ability to start thinking about open REST APIs, we have a thing called Delta Cloud which we developed at Red Hat three years ago which is now with the Apache Incubator which enables you to write an application to, to talk to, to Delta Cloud which then will talk to any Delta Cloud compatible hypervisor layer. So Amazon, I don't think Microsoft Azure support, it was actually broken for example. Um, but it works quite happily across Zen, across KVM, et cetera, et cetera. And to start thinking that you should be able to write an application, be able to host it anyway, you shouldn't have to think about having an application, have it written three or four different ways to talk to three or four different clouds. You should only have to write it once. But thinking that Linux, as an open standard, really powers clouds. So these figures, are, these figures are about seven or eight weeks old. 87% um, of cloud worldwide runs on, on Linux, and about 72% of that is based on Red Hat. So it's, it's quite a lot of code. And if you look at the standard development environments, it's, it's the old favorites. It's PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby on Rails, a lot of OpenJRE in there. 
And we're very lucky in the, in the community where we have things like jboss.org, which is a, a massive ecosystem for companies who want to go out there and to use JBoss technologies without paying Red Hat one red cent of revenue. And if you look at big companies like Vodafone, Vodafone do their entire application development on JBoss, and they don't pay Red Hat one cent. It's not a great revenue earner for us. But from a success story, it enables us to see that JBoss has been able to come in and replace Lotus Notes, to replace WebSphere, etc., etc., and to show that it's a proven standard in cloud. As I said already, we should be thinking about how we harness the skills that your staff already have. And to be able to go to universities across Europe and to pick the best graduates who are hungry and able to go out there to help you take, get to the next stage of growth in your organization. But because we're open, we benefit from this huge disruptive force in technology being the whole open source marketplace, which I've spent the last 15, 16 years working on. And it's hard, don't get me wrong. I, I've, I've sat in front of major decision makers in the US government who said, if it's free, it must be rubbish. I remember doing a piece of work for Hewlett Packard once, and we couldn't get past a not school with them until we sent them an invoice for $5. You know, that, that, because there had to be an invoice value for something. But we also need to start thinking about security, about how we, how, how we actually physically talk about security in cloud. And one of the things that Red Hat do is we employ the best people. We, we're very picky about who we employ. And we have the likes uh, of Dan Walsh in the SE Linux team, who has spent his last six or eight years working on SE Linux and Esper, so we have that separation in the kernel, so that when you deploy Red Hat Enterprise to Linux, <coughs> you already have that jailing, that routing, actually within that instance, so that you've built that brick wall between that virtualized instance and the next provision instance. And we need to start thinking about how we get past customer arguments around security, around people assuming that because you go into a multi-tenant environment that it must be insecure. How do we talk about isolation? How do we talk about segregation? How do we do it with authority as people who are genuinely involved and interested in mobile technologies? So as I said, we have built-in expert segregation built into the Red Hat kernel. Um, and it's quite funny because I was approached by uh, a major government customer who came back to us. That they, they buy a lot of Red Hat offers, but we've got 14,000 servers. And uh, they came to us having gone to speak to another technology organization and said that we'd like to start talking to you about security. We'd like to start talking about retrofitting security into our virtualized Hadoop instance. Um, how much is it going to cost us? And my salesman was really annoyed when I turned around and said, nothing. You've already got it. You've already paid for it. It's there. You just need to turn it on. It's a flag. And when you talk to customers, they don't get the fact that they think, as I said, if it's open, you know, it's just cheaper than a Microsoft Select license. It's not necessarily good. When you start explaining the benefits and features of working with the open community and working with open features, open standards, suddenly the penny does drop. In Europe, we are handcuffed slightly, Gartner would have you believe, that we are lagging behind the rest of the developed world. An article appeared about two and a half weeks ago from Gartner saying that there were four or five inhibitors to going to cloud in Europe because we were, I don't want to use the word retarded, but if you read the whole article, that's what they were saying. They were saying that we have no money. We tie ourselves in knots talking about data privacy and data regulations. We don't know how to trade with each other. And we don't know how to talk to each other as member entities within the European Union and Switzerland and Luxembourg, etc., etc. And I picked up the phone and I spoke to my marketing department in the States and said, this article's rubbish. And I had quite a popular blog that, I don't know if any of you have read it, called cloudevangelist.org. Um, and very often I'll write an article on there and it'll get 65,000 hits and appear in the, in the press. And I wanted to write an article to say, Gartner are talking shit. But my analysts, you can't say that about Gartner. They're, they're a big company, you can't poke them with a stick. So I, I, I wrote a structured article last week to say, actually Gartner are wrong. I'm not saying Gartner are wrong. Here are some real research patterns from within the European Union which say they're wrong. Actually, in the European Union, we probably have more idea how to talk to ourselves. We've deliberately put work in Strasbourg and Brussels to understand what data privacy and data regulations look like as a data controller or a data processor. Much more than just having safe harbor and the US Patriot Act, which actually don't help you go to work. Gartner weren't very happy when the article went on. But being open 
when we start talking to customers about security, it terrifies them. And it's no good for me as Richard from Red Hat to go and talk to them about a granular security policy around cloud. So for the last four and a half years, I've been working with the Cloud Security Alliance, non-paid outside of Red Hat. And there are 86 people now involved with a thing called the Cloud Security Alliance uh, CCN, it's the controls matrix. Has anyone heard of this at all or seen it? Spreadsheet? So a few of you have seen it. For those of you who aren't aware of what it is, this is probably one of the most important things you're going to take out of today. This is a freely available spreadsheet which is updated regularly on the Cloud Security Alliance website, which tells you how to engage with your customer, your vertical, talking to them about cloud or virtualization, how to talk to them about security controls which you require to be able to put in to safeguard their data, to protect them against audit risks around PCI, Basel, ISO, etc., etc., etc. So go and have a look at it. But we have conflicting demands in cloud. We have developers who are impatient people. They want to be able to do stuff quickly. They want to have agile development resources. They want to have self-service portals. They want to have the choice of development environments. And then you have the IT operations guys who are terrified of these guys. Absolutely terrified of them. Who want everything standard, everything secure. They want, they want to have governance and control of processes and procedures, etc., etc. And they're terrified of being locked into a, to a, to a vendor platform. So we have to balance the whole flexibility between what developers want and what the IT management want. So we've deployed a thing called Cloud Balls, which was launched two weeks ago. We've been working on this for about 18 months in the community on a thing called the AOS project. And the AOS project essentially gave us a, a list of components and an infrastructure as a service environment which would sit on top of any heterogeneous cloud environment, be it ESXi, be it, be it OpenStack, be it a Red Hat, be it a Zen platform to bring all that cloud automation to uh, your environment, to allow organizations to, to be able to deploy applications and to deploy processes and data into a cloud, but to only do it once and to start thinking about how you can move things backwards and forwards between cloud hosting providers and to be able to do it without risk. So the whole automization procedure, now with a graphical user interface, and you know, we're into release 1.0, it goes live next week in Boston at Cloud Center. And we have templates and definitions for almost every type of application. The ability for you to build your own image library. I think called Cloud Engine, which is replacing the Red Hat Network Satellite Engine. Mm -hmm. Some cool. of you may have used. Okay. And then once you beat that, the rest of it is built Cloud API, so that you can stripe your data across your physical data center you already own, your vSphere platform, your Red platform, or your public cloud. It shouldn't matter. It should just work. So I need you to understand the whole application life cycle thing, which usually costs you an absolute fortune. And it's one of the hidden things about cloud, is that people understand how much service costs, they understand how much the technology costs, but the hidden thing is the actual process between how you get there, from where you are to where you need to go, all the building of the processes, procedures, the life cycle stuff. Very often, that's probably a third to half of your cloud costs. And when you're talking to a large organization who's moving nine, ten thousand 10,000 servers, that's a huge piece of money, and they never budget for it. So Cloud Forms allows us to solve some problems. We have self-service portals. We have the ability to the application lifecycle that I already discussed. The ability to have portability of applications across diverse clouds. I don't care if it's a Red Hat cloud or an ESX my cloud. I couldn't care less. VMware owned 95% of the marketplace. Why am I just going to write a technology to support 5%? I want something which will work across all platforms. But using a proven stack, using the JBoss stack, using the, the Gluster stack, uh, and to be able to work with customers to be able to have the enterprise level service agreements which they can actually take home and that actually means something to them. Who, who here has actually picked up an Amazon service agreement and looked at the security section? It's 27 pages long and it might just have two words that says no liability. <laughs> 27 pages, two words. So we've got the ability to have enterprise IT operations, thinking about governance, risk and control, the ability to have regulations and to be able to manage those and to actually audit against them and to be able to have consistent environments. But to also to have all of that stuff delivered quickly, on demand, and very, very efficiently. So we've now built a, a stack with Red Hat and JBoss and the JBoss Operations Network, which is like satellite for JBoss, to have all your hybrid cloud development across multiple tiers, um, and to have all the auto scaling, and all the provisioning goodness that you normally see from cloud, but to be able to do it yourself out of the box. And JBoss really gives us the ability to have um, the whole 
containerization of everything that you need from a plug-in perspective to go to work, I'm talking about messaging and grid computing and to be able to push security policies and to make them stick, and to start thinking about your high availability requirements, tear up, tear down, think about your caching, and all of the stuff that, that you require as a service provider, but also then to have rule sets to be able to do all the integration and to be able to think about where you want to go in the future with the ability to support all those development environments, and that's growing every week. I'd like to see Mono in there. I'd really like to see Mono in there. If we can get to a stage in the community where Mono in the cloud allows us to start porting some .NET stuff, I think that's going to be uber critical over the next six, eight, 12 months. I, I don't see it happening that quickly, and we're trying to throw money at it to make it happen, but money doesn't necessarily grease the wheels in the open source community. T-shirts and beer and pizza are not necessarily money. <laughs> So we have the JDOS Operations Network, which enables us to do the deployment, the management, and the monitoring, to think about high availability, to think how we have customer learning, how we can make things more enterprise friendly for organizations who are used to working with things like Tivoli and Netcool, who are used to having those old fashioned SNMP based technologies in the mix, to allow them to have those KPI figures that everyone goes to work on. And then we came up with OpenShift. We acquired a little company in California called Macara uh, about 18 months ago. And the Macara guys had a, had a really cool way of thinking about platform as a service. And, and Red Hat didn't have a platform as a service offering. We had, we had JBoss, middleware in the cloud, which I suppose is, is platform as a service. But OpenShift enables us to have a, a, the ability to deploy now on any service provider with a level of ambition to give them a PaaS out of the box. So that there's a cartridge-based extension engine to allow ISV plugins with other vendors, the ability to support enterprise J uh, open JRE open standards with JBoss, mm -hmm. but to have the secure multi-tenant operating system underneath. So you have that level of segregation and that level of reporting and audit. Barlog messages is your friend. Um, and the ability for the development community and the developer tools there out of the box so that if you've got your Eclipse or your Blade or your whatever your idea of choice, that you are supported. And built entirely on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's, it's, there's no shocks there. You know, I, I think one of the things that we don't do very well in the open source community is push and promote, as I was saying on my earlier slides, the skill sets of the people that we work with every day who have been building Kickstart images and building Linux boxes since the dawn of time. Um, it's very simple to take a kernel level guy and turn him into a cloud guy because he already has the skill sets there. It's a question of him understanding how KVM operates, how he can interoperate with platforms and with OpenShift, to do all the scripting. And really, it's giving you as an organization, if you're a small ISV predominantly working with Linux, the ability to add another stream to your boat, to go from just being a Linux service center to also being a cloud service center doing all this OpenShift stuff. So you know, we have all the goodness from RHEL, the control groups, the SE Linux, et cetera, et cetera, to, to give you that, that level of granularity. And based on my enterprise technology, um, we should be able to build a cloud where we can deploy an application into an instance, and we don't have the potential weakness where another application in another instance, which is rooted, then becomes a risk to another part of that platform. We should be able to guarantee security <coughs> out the box. This is important. We talked about how OpenShift has the ability to support these multiple languages. But one of the things that the JBoss community didn't do very well when we acquired them was understand how to make money. Now, all of you, I'm presuming, make money. Um, we have a lot of JBoss.org stuff out there in the world that we make no revenue from, which is great from a, from a food chain, because many companies will develop something in JBoss.org in a sample. And then when they want to go to work, they realize they have to have it supported, so they go to jboss.com. That's great. That's a small percentage of it. The majority of jboss.org stuff, we don't see any revenue from. But they may host it on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That's great. What we're looking for now in, in Europe, essentially, is partners who are interested in taking their companies to the next level, thinking about the whole Java development cycle. People are getting sick and tired of using WebSphere and WebLogic. There has to be other opportunities to do it. Now, if you don't do it, if you don't help us do it, your customers are probably going to do it anyway. They're going to do it without you. And we're seeing that now in, in the UK, we're seeing in Germany and France, where lots of customers are developing their own jboss.org 
environments which then their system integrator partner all of a sudden inherits and has to manage this mess. We're looking for companies who want to add another string to their bow to start thinking about how they can work with us with regards to understanding the middleware, BRMS, how to start thinking about the full OpenShift stack. So we have thousands of ISV partners now. I think it's 1,460 ISV partners. Hardly thousands, but thousands of ISV partners. Um, 10 Gen, Accelerator, and there's, there's, there's plenty of them who allow us to work with them to provide these plug-in containers to make, to make OpenShift more palatable to customers. And that, that's only going to grow. So we support quite a few. It's growing all the time. And then we have public cloud ecosystems. We have no surprise, Swisscom. Um, does anyone here know Thomas von Benchler at all from Switchcom, from Syscom? So Thomas is a bit of a god. Um, I've been working with Thomas for about seven or eight years. I, you know, if you if you look on a, 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 a Linux forum and end your search in .ch, most of the emails are from him. Um, so we've been working with with Swisscom for some time to build a certified cloud provider structure, and we have these. Globally, we have a few in Finland, we have a few in the UK, and one in France, and one in Germany, where we stand up an entire Red Hat environment. And again, it's, it's a bit of a weird one. We don't make a huge amount of money out of it. What we're looking for is Red Hat partners who can become a cloud provider, where a customer with a Red Hat stack or with a Red Hat license can lift and shift. So he's got 960 servers. He can lift and shift. 320 or however many he wants to that cloud provider. And all of a sudden the cloud provider now has a new revenue stream. He has those 320 servers which have migrated over to his to his portal, to his to his data center. The customer doesn't know anything different because instead of having 900 licenses there and 300 there, he now has 600 here and 300 here. He's not making Red Hat don't make one red cent of revenue, but Swisscom now has 300 extra instances that they can build for on a monthly basis. And that allows us to walk away from analyst suggestions that Red Hat is ever going to be a cloud provider. We have no ambition whatsoever to be a cloud provider. I think our shareholders and our share price would go through the floor if someone thought that we had to find $150 million a quarter to try and stand up data centers for one. So with the Red Hat certified cloud provider platform, we have the ability to take any level of company involved in data center based managed hosting. I prefer to use the phrase managed hosting to take them to the next level to become a cloud provider where they can now start thinking about moving those enterprise workloads to cloud. It's the paying workloads to cloud. And to push and promote those Red Hat customers to be able to get to cloud safely and securely because you can't be a Red Hat certified cloud provider unless you build your cloud around Red Hat. So when the customer takes his stack there and builds his instance, he should be getting the same transparent experience that he would have doing in his data center. So traditionally when we talk about cloud to customers, they get a little bit insecure because they can't run downstairs and pull an ethernet cable or a piece of fiber or a piece of mesh out of a platform because all of a sudden it's in someone else's data center. With the whole Red Hat Certified Cloud Provider program, we're saying actually that's not true. Everything that you do traditionally in your data center is mirrored exactly in a segregated instance in a Red Hat Certified Cloud Provider. Platform. So Swisscom was the first one in Switzerland. I don't think it's a huge one, it makes up 12,000 servers. Um, but across Europe we have <coughs> seven or eight. But I'm actually looking for people who want to be specialist cloud provider partners. In Germany I have one uh, major organization who has two major German banks who've moved their stuff onto a Red Hat cloud. People say banking doesn't go to cloud. I have two of the major German banks who are moving large amounts of workloads to a Red Hat certified cloud because there's the segregation there with Esper and the segregation there at the kernel level. So we're looking for people who are involved in working with customers who are working in the health industry, who are working in industry, who are working in finance, who want to work with us to start moving those enterprise workloads. It doesn't matter how open we are. It doesn't matter what story we tell. Analysts will say, if you let them, like Gartner did four weeks ago, that we're behind the rest of the world because people would not start moving those workloads. About 15 years ago, there was a Kevin Costner film Field of Dreams, where he built the baseball stadium for the ghosts to come and play baseball. And that's an analogy I use when I start talking about cloud, because I can name, I'm not going to, but I could name four or five major, major vendors in Europe who have spent 
hundreds of millions of euros standing up data centers, which are running at less than 2% capability for cloud. Which defines the whole scaling. What's the point of having scalability and elastic computing if you've got all these servers sitting there doing nothing? They've gone away and they've thought, well, all I need to be a cloud provider is to build a VMware cluster, a vSphere, vDirect, or whatever. And automatically, I've got a cloud. It's all going to go spending the money. You've then got to attract the revenue. You're all businesses. We all have to make money. We all have to make gross revenue margin. And to do that, you need to start thinking sensibly. You need to start thinking openly. But you need to start thinking about how you get past a lot of the uh, objections that customers will have talking to you about cloud and talking to you about doing things using other technologies such as Linux. So that's me in a nutshell. We have a, a Red Hat office here. Uh, Philip's in the audience. Uh, Martin from Puzzles. Where's Martin? Yeah. No, it should be out. Okay, um, I have a, 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 a quite a, a popular blog, so by all means engage with me via my blog. Uh, there's an open cloud portal, I've got a Twitter feed which is quite humorous. Um, or alternatively, um, I don't just work for Red Hat, I'm also the cloud guy at Linux.com for my sins, unpaid for the last god knows how many years. Uh, so I wear both hats. Um, so I'm very easy to find. Very easy to find. Thank you very much. Any questions at all? Sorry for hiring on my time, but I know you all desperate to eat. Sure. So you have some figures uh, in one of your opening slides. Yeah. One of these figures was about seventy-two um, percent of the <coughs> capacity is unpaid by Red Hat. Seventy-two percent of paying cloud is on Red Hat. Okay. Like, where's the figure coming from? From our figures, which are published every quarter. If you look at our $1.13 billion revenue stream last year, 46% of it came from cloud, from cloud-based subscriptions. So that's people who are actually paying to go to cloud. You can't capture the people who are running Debian screens. You can't capture the people who are running CentOS. But generally, it's not an issue because we don't see it. When you go into a data center, um, if you listen to Mark Shuttleworth and the Canonical guys, and I'm not getting political here because a lot of my friends work at Canonical, um, they will say to you that you know Ubuntu cloud ready, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You go to a data center, you do not see it. You might see it on Amazon, but if you look at the average life expectancy for most, including Red Hat, if you look at the average life expectancy for people who use Linux on Amazon, it's about 32 days. So people are just racking up to test applications. They're not moving things wholesale for 365 days. What everyone in this room has got to do if they're serious about open cloud is start thinking how we attract those customers and how we retain them. And the only way you're going to do that is by building reputation, thinking about the value-added services that you all, as technologists, can start thinking about whether it's a security perspective, thinking about what you can do around the whole governance piece. I mentioned the cloud security rights control matrix thing. That's really important to get an understanding of what that gives you. And to start thinking as, a, as an organization about where you want to be. Um, if you need help from Red Hat to get there, that's what I'm here for. I spend my entire life, I've got a one-year-old child who I've watched grow up on Skype. I spend my entire life in airports and taxis talking to customers and talking to end-user end organizations who want to take their customer to, to the next level, but they may not have the skill sets to do it, or they may need that helping hand to do it. And part of my job at Red Hat is to be an incubator to assist you to help you to get there. Okay? Thank you very much.